Good evening from the Gail Lemron Auditorium in the Captain Willie Miller Building on the campus of Embry-Riddle. Welcome to the Embry-Riddle Speaker Series event. I'm Mark Bernier, the moderator for tonight's event and interview. It's a Q&A session where we're going to talk about the military, military readiness, bravery, and overcoming adversity. We are very privileged to present a very specially nationally renowned figure with us this evening, and I want to thank the Division of Inclusion um, and Diversity here at Embry-Riddle for helping to make this, and to Ken Hunt for reaching out to me uh, to see if we could put this into the Embry-Riddle Speaker Series. Linda L. Singh is a Major General of the Maryland Army National Guard. She was appointed as the 29th Adjunct General of Maryland, effective January 21st of 2015, responsible for the daily operations of the Maryland Military Department, which includes, listen to this, the Maryland Army National Guard, Maryland Air National Guard, Maryland Emergency Management Agency, and the Maryland Defense Force. She's a senior advisor to the Governor of Maryland. She is responsible for the readiness, administration, and training of more than 6,700 members of the military department. As the Adjunct General, she serves as the official channel of communication between the Governor and the National Guard Bureau and serves as a member of the Governor's Cabinet. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our honor and privilege tonight to present Major General Linda Singh. So I've done a few of these, General, over the years, and I have to tell you, it's the first time I can honestly say in a while, I'm plumb embarrassed. Your military record is extraordinary, and I'd like to begin by thanking you for your service to our nation, to your state, and for coming to be with us at Every Riddle tonight. Well, thank you very much. I do appreciate that. Thank you. When you were coming into the military, did you have any idea where you would end up so many years later? No, not at all, because I came in as a private E1 at the age of 17, and so it was, it was my intent to stay for a very short period and get out. And that was really to help pay for my education, uh, to help me be able to move forward. And so I had no intention of staying for as long as I have. When you came into the military, what did you have to overcome? Was race still a part of it by the time you were in the military? And did you have to overcome prejudicial treatment? I mean, so race was still an issue, um, and I'm not going to say that it's totally gone today, right? I mean, we still have issues where uh, we're not necessarily, and I say we, you know I mean, where when you look at in terms of diversity, we're not where we need to be in terms of the numbers, not at the senior level. So we have still a lot of work, but that doesn't mean that we haven't made a lot of improvement. Uh, gender was definitely a, an issue and a challenge, but I think uh, for me, um, the biggest thing that I would have to say, even outside of all those things, and when you always have to think about, you know, what do you have to do to face that? What do you have to do to work harder? Um, it's not as blatant sometimes as you would think that it would be. But the biggest challenge I think that I had to get over was myself. Uh, I carried a lot of baggage with me coming into the military. You were and homeless once, am I correct? That's correct. So I, w I was homeless. Uh, I felt like everybody in the world was against me. And so I had to kind of get over myself. And I say myself, it's like you have to drop the attitude. You have to figure out how are you going to start moving beyond and stop thinking that everything is working against you because unfortunately that's just life. And, and life is hard. Life is tough. And so you're going to have setbacks. And so that was probably the biggest thing that I had to really figure out. How do I get over that? How do I release and let go of some of that, that baggage? You mentioned your mother to me before we began. Did she want you to go in the military? Or if she didn't, what did she say when you said, this is what I'm going to do with my life? <laughs> so I wasn't living at home, and I didn't ask her whether or not she wanted me to go into the military. I sent the recruiter to go get the signature that he needed from my parents, so I have no clue. <laughs> so, I mean, I say that. I really didn't have a conversation, um, and, and I felt like it really wasn't necessarily their choice. Um, and so just in terms of going back and, and having that conversation, I will tell you that, you know, regardless of, of the relationship that I have with my mom, but she's extremely proud of what I've been able to do. 
And so, you know, sometimes parents just don't show it in, in all of the same ways, but my mom is extremely proud of what I've accomplished in my career. Married for 26 years. Your husband is a facilities manager in the private sector, I believe. Yes. And tell us about your two offspring. So my two daughters, um, so one from my first marriage is a police officer and a uh, detective with the um, Prince George's County Police Force. And she's been on the force about 12 years and she's pretty fearsome. I didn't know what to think about one of my babies actually carrying a gun every single day, but had to kind of get over that because a mom is always protective. And then my youngest daughter um, is a uh, graduate of University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County. And uh, she's a biology uh, major, so she graduated with a biology degree. She works with a group of optometrists and ophthalmologists as a, a scribe, and so she's looking forward to going to physician assistant school here in the next couple of years. Good for you, and good for them. The, to, because this is a very high-rated topic right now in the news, we wanted to go right to it and ask you the, this tough issue of sexual harassment. Were you ever a victim of sexual harassment in the military? So not necessarily in the military as it was in the civilian side. Right now, you know, have I had folks come on to me? Absolutely. Um, and you got to figure out, okay, how are you going to deal with that? But the, the problem for me is that I had already dealt with um, not only sexual harassment from a family member, so my brother, uh, but being put out of my home as a result of it. And so by the time I started having this issue in the military, I had just had enough. And I had already said the buck stops with me. And, and when I say that, meaning, you know, I had a senior NCO that called me and invited me to a car show, and I was an E4. And he told me, well, you know, you need to do what I tell you to do. And I'm just like, oh, no, I don't think so. I said, unless you want me wearing your stripes, this conversation is over. And so, but, but that is a very kind of different position for me because I had just had enough. And I refused to be in the situation where anyone, even if it meant my career, that was going to take advantage of me again. And so uh, if I kind of fast forward things, then, you know, I become the commander of a maintenance company and one of my soldiers um, has an infatuation with me. And that was a very different situation. And what that actually made me open my eyes to is that sometimes, you know, we laugh off or kind of laugh at some of the things that occur. And there could be some serious underlying issues that we may need to deal with. And in that particular case, this guy was on the verge of stalking me. And he's an E4. I mean, he's like, what do you do? And so what I did is I documented everything and put him out, put him out of the military. Um, and that was a tough choice, but it was one of those things where you have to figure out, well, where are you going to stand on this issue? And how am I going to set the example to say, you, we just can't do this? Were you surprised at how blatant people could be? I am surprised every day about how blatant people can be. I mean, I, I now in, in my role where I see a lot of these, these cases that we get that come up to me, and I am shocked. And a lot of them are old cases, meaning they're people who are now just getting the courage to come forward. And I am seriously surprised at the level in which people feel that they can assert some level of influence over, over other individuals. And I, you know, I don't want to say that it's, it's something that we've allowed in, in society, but I think it was not as well uh, dealt with in the past. And now we're just getting to the point where I just think we have a lot more avenues to be able to deal with it. And so we shouldn't tolerate it. Um, but I think what really surprises me is no matter how many times we try to educate folks, I still have people that come up and do stupid things. The thing that amazes me, and from when we had our first phone conversation through tonight, is to watch you and listen to your delivery and think all the bad stuff that happened to you would harden a heart and a personality, yet you're very much in command and confident. Did you go through a phase, General, when you came into the, or before as you were coming into the military, that you had to process that anger and get help? so that you were able to assume the personality of a military person who becomes a leader. I'm just fascinated by that part of it and wanted to know if you could offer some pearls of wisdom to our audience here, many of which intend to make their entire careers in the military. How did you process? Well, so I think you know, the biggest growth for me was 
not just on the military side, but on the civilian side, because I was part-time military. And so my civilian uh, career had a lot to do with that. And me working around more senior individuals and really them being a role model, and some of them were retired military. Um, and so them really being a role model for me and helping me to see that there were different ways to be able to deal with things. And so I really did have to go through kind of a transformation I started having to ask myself, is this the type of person that I want to be? Do I want to be angry all the time? Is that really who, truly who I want to be? And you know, does it make me happy? I mean, at the end of the day, if, if I am angry because you know, I feel like something has been done to me, does that solve the problem at the end of the day? And the answer is no, it doesn't. So then you have to turn around and ask yourself, so what are you going to change about that situation? I can't change other people necessarily. I can try to influence them, but I cannot change their actions. I can't change their responses. I can't change how they act towards me. What I can change is how I act and my, my reaction and my interaction. And so that's what I started focusing on. Is it hard to be a general, knowing the responsibility, the eyes that are upon you, the people that come under your command? Is it hard? I would or, say... Or fatiguing, because you've got to maintain this level. <laughs> So I look at it as in I'm always under spotlight, but if I live my life the way that I was taught to live my life, and when I say when I was taught, you know, my grandmother taught me certain core values, and that's what I'm using to fall back on. You know, my grandmother was one of the nicest people ever, and when I look at how she treated other people, my grandmother used to clean other people's houses for a living and still come home and take care of all of her kids. And she had 14 kids. And so she was just an amazing woman. And when I look at that level of power and what she really showed us when we were, we were younger and how to be good citizens, I actually went back and, and said, that's how I want to live my life. While you know, we are doing different things and she might have you know, not as been as educated, she taught me more in that time frame than I probably learned my whole life about how to be a citizen, how to be a young woman, and how to be a leader uh, within the community. And so I'm, I'm using that as I have to re kind of reflect back on that and say, I've been taught all of the right things. So General, does it follow that she was a professional and personal role model for you? Absolutely. Use her as a beacon? I, I absolutely do. Because when I look at the times in which she came up, and you know, she never once complained about my grandfather. I never seen them argue in all the years. They were married you know, so many years before you know, he passed away. But when I look at, she raised 14 kids. She delivered them all at home, except for she actually had 17 kids, three died at birth. The very last one she had in a hospital. And then she took in myself at three months of age and had me until I was nine. That's an amazing woman. And every weekend, the family would gather at her house. And it was a four-room house. We never complained about not having enough food because she made sure we had enough food. She made sure she did the laundry. And then she still went out and worked and took care of other families. And so that to me, when I look at that, most people today could not endure that. And that's a level of respect that I don't think that we hear. Um, I don't think we develop that. I don't think we develop the understanding of, of what individuals had to go through before us and how do we develop a level of respect from that. General Colin Powell was in Daytona Beach a few years ago and I had the privilege of speaking with him. And he talked about the colorblind military, that, that true servants of their nation yeah. never see color at all. Can you speak to that issue in your experience? Those who come under your command, do they eventually, through proper training and understanding of their commitment to their nation, not see color, or will they always see color? I think, so the difference is that we all get equal opportunity. And I'm not going to say that it's necessarily colorblind, and maybe it's more that we're color proud. We are proud about the differences that we bring to the table. And I think, 
you know, I, I would like us to, to kind of move from saying that we're colorblind and be color proud. And, um, and, and that means that we are celebrating the diversity that we bring and recognizing the fact that we are all different. And, and that to me is where we get the best of thought. That's where we get the best of capability when we celebrate those differences and we really utilize them. That's what makes us a strong military. It is the diversity that we bring that diversity of thought, that diversity of capability, that's what makes us the superpower. We're going to get to service in just a moment, and we want all of those, ROTC and beyond, who are in our audience to think of your questions for General Singh coming up in just a moment. I have to ask this as a component of who you are, General. Are you a spiritual person? Was there faith in your life that helped carry you during dark times? Absolutely. So I am an incredibly... Um, spiritual person in my own way. So some people would challenge that and they'd say, okay, she doesn't go to church every single day or whatever. But I, I have in my house a meditation room. That is my, my private place that I like to be able to go. And so I don't just arbitrarily allow people to go in there because uh, I like to keep it as, as sacred and as clean as possible. But when I look at, I, I grew up um, Methodist uh, in the morning, uh, Baptist in the afternoon, because my, my uncle was a deacon in the Baptist church. Uh, my summer camps, I went to uh, Catholic, uh, a Catholic summer camp during the summer. Um, so when I think of my undergraduate degree, is from a seven-day Adventist school. My husband is Hindu. Um, well, you're a little of everything, Joe. And I have nieces that are Catholic. I have nieces that are Muslim. I have a sister-in-law who's Muslim. So, so faith so plays a role in your life. It's... It, it is, um, you know, we all will come together and we're a very strong, a strong family in that sense. And a lot of that is because we have very strong beliefs. While we may uh, worship different deities or we have different religions, that does not mean that we do not have a very strong belief system. Before we get to your involvement with the National Guard and you're on the governor's cabinet in the state of Maryland, let's talk about foreign service, your tours of duty. Explain to our audience where you went and when you went back and forth. I think, what, at least two tours, am I correct? Absolutely. So the first one was in Kosovo, so that's in the Balkans. And I was there for a year, um, which was very different. I mean, it, it was a great assignment. It's, it's different in the sense that it was peacekeeping, so I was allowed to get out beyond the, the fence. I mean, you could go out around the town, so it was, it was, it was different in that sense, whereas my, my tour in Afghanistan was a little bit more controlled, even though I did spend a lot of time back and forth between um, the bases at, in Kabul. Um, just because of my role caused me to have to go out and deal with the Afghan National Army and the National Police. But um, two different deployments, um, two very different dimensions, and a lot of lessons. I would have to say that I learned more lessons from the second deployment. It was more eye-opening. Um, you know, you don't realize how bad things can get until you're kind of in those environments, and I wasn't even in the worst part of it. And so I think it really helps you to understand not only some things about yourself, but what you can, what you can actually do. How much can you put yourself to in terms of the test? And in really, how much can you endure? And, and I say that because you know, we lost a, a member of our team during that deployment, and it gives you kind of a, a new, I don't want to say a new leash on life, but it really makes you say that you know, not, you know, we are not um, given and we are not promised tomorrow. And, and so if that is the case, then you need to live every single day as if it's your last. That means you want to live it on the highest order. You want to be able to do all of the things and not regret a single moment. And so I think that deployments can help bring out something in you that you may not have known that you had the, the courage or the capability to be able to do. Was well, part of the reason you were selected for this assignment with the National Guard and all those that would come under your command, the, the different, I think it's 6,700 people in total, was partially because you have a history with the state that they felt very confident putting a trained, ready to take charge commander in who also has an appreciation for the state of Maryland. Was that, did that enter into it when, they, when you got the post? Well, I mean, I, I'm going to make an assumption because I don't know how they went about the selection necessarily, but I know that I was, I was one of a, a number of candidates that was looked at. 
And I would have to say that I think when they looked at my, my bio and they looked at my background and experience, and then based off of the interview, the feeling that, that I got, and I don't want to put you know, words in their mouths, but the feeling that I got is that I was the most capable person. And you notice I said person. I was the most capable person for the job. And I would have to, to kind of rest on that. I think that it was not just that I had a relationship uh, within the state, because that's the state that I've, I've been, spent most of my career with, but I think it was more so the experiences that I brought, and not just the military side, but my private industry experience. That's where I was going to follow and ask you, how much of your private industry experience were you able to call upon to lead in the military? Oh, I, oh a lot. Um, so my, my last assignment before uh, retiring from Accenture, which is a global consulting company of almost 400 and some thousand personnel, and, and so I retired at a very senior level, but I was managing, you know, I was the director of operations for their health and public service North America operating unit. And that meant all the programs and, and plans, all of the things that they were doing to implement uh, programs uh, with clients that were at the local, federal, uh, Department of Defense level. And so my experience was, was pretty broad. And when you look at bringing that consulting background to um, really even a military environment, it gives me a very different view of things. It allows me to, to be in a very inquisitive state about what a person's needs are. And when I say a person, a person, an organization, or whoever it is that I'm working with, and it really does allow me to see things from a very different perspective. And that, to me, is a big differentiator between myself and some of my counterparts. You had a budget of over $3 billion a year, I think. Yes, 3.6. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> um, and you had talked to me yes. about your training, your education. I think one of the places was Toro that you went to? Toro International. Mm -hmm. What was it that you did there? What was it you picked up from Toro International? A, a master's in business administration. And, and mainly because when I looked at where my, my career was going on the civilian side, um, business was a key component of that. And so I used that degree to allow me to get deeper into the business of the organization so that I can understand you know, what's driving us in terms of strategy, what's drive, you know, what's, what are we doing in terms of marketing, and how is that linking up with our strategy. So it gave me a whole different perspective of what it meant to run the business. And, and I really needed that. I needed that in terms of, you know, how am I going to be helping my leaders kind of, you know, think forwardly about where the business is going and in what space we're going to go in and how do we make organizational changes? How do we do talent management? Because all of those pieces kind of fell within my purview, even though I didn't have direct management over them. They all fell within the realm of, of the operational piece. One of the things that you said to me before we started is you consider yourself an apolitical person, regardless who the governor is, and you enjoy a good professional relationship with the governor Absolutely. of Maryland. But regardless who the governor is, you're there, and they deal with you, and you're in the cabinet of the governor. When you're in foreign service and you have men and women under your command, one has to wonder, how do you keep politics out without crushing their spirit? In other words, there's military protocol, and for those non-military people who may be watching and listening, how do you keep that down without censoring? Because politics can destroy people. How do you, how do you handle that, General? Well, so first off, I don't get into a political discussion. And, and I don't really talk to politics in, in that sense. So you know. But if it's in the rank and file, do you have to snuff it out? If it's in the rank and file, I mean, everybody's going to have their opinion, but, but their opinion, it, you know, in terms of the politics, it's no place in the, in the military for us to be voicing our opinion. Um, so we have, um, we have rank and file, and our commander-in-chief is our commander-in-chief. There is no doubt about it, and that is the position. And so we have, to be, we have to be very, very careful to make sure that we do not stray from that. And, and that is important, that, because that's part of our values and culture. And if we let that piece of it go, then we're kind of letting pieces of, of ourselves, the most important pieces of ourselves go. And so we have to make sure that we are holding to the rank and structure that we're supposed to. 
And, and it should not be about whether it's a Republican, a Democrat, or an independent. It should be about the person that has that job. They are in that job. We are democracy. We vote them in. And once they become the commander in chief or the governor, because the governor is also my commander in chief, then we need to march forward. You were in one of the most difficult positions a person in leadership could ever be in. 60 days into your job in Maryland, you're having a conversation with the governor about how to maintain peace in Baltimore. Would you take us through some of those discussions? What happened? How did it start for you? You, you were just finding everything where it belongs and the chain of command and doing your pre-interviews and suddenly there's a crisis. What happened? Well, so the good thing is that I had been on the a director of the joint staff and then I was the army commander. So it's not like I was unfamiliar with the capabilities of the guard. But as a, as a new adjutant general, I was reorganizing and, and moving things around on the team, moving leaders around. So that, we were kind of right in the midst of that. But the good thing is that a lot of the individuals that serve with me, I've known for a long time. And meaning I know their capabilities, I know what they do well. And so when we started looking at Baltimore and I think you know, the biggest thing for me is I have to focus in on, well, here's my role, and here's what I have to make sure that I am doing and doing right. I have to be that advisor to the governor. I am, I am there as, as his or her, but in this case, his advisor. And so I have to maintain that level of composure to say, what does the governor need from us, and how do I ensure that we get it to the quickest you know, in the quickest manner possible. Now, I leaned forward in terms of uh, on the Baltimore side. And when I say I leaned forward, you've seen us come in on that Monday evening, but I was already looking at stuff that Friday. And mainly because the state police superintendent, as well as the emergency manager, gave me a call and said, hey, ma'am, we need to come see you. Now, I know when they're coming to my office and they're just calling me out of the blue, that means there's something going on. And so... Um, when they came in to see me, they really wanted to run some things by me and some of their concerns about what um, they were feeling behind this whole incident. And so when they left my office, I, you know, we really were, were looking at, do we ask the governor to go ahead and activate the National Guard now? And we felt like that could actually cause things to kind of go off the rails. So we, we really didn't want to You didn't want to escalate, that. General, right? We, we didn't want to escalate, and we didn't want to add to the problems. But... What I did want to be able to do is if we were called, I want to be able to respond as quickly as possible because time is not on your side when you get into those types of situations. And so we started doing what we call these test alerts, meaning I wanted them to be able to have 100% accountability of all of our folks. I wanted to know where they are and I wanted to know of our uh, quick reaction force, right? So the, the first force that I call in how many of them are we going to be able to get, and do I have enough? And so we ran that the whole weekend. And basically, I just kind of gave everyone the, you know, please do not stray more than, you know, this far from home. Keep your bags packed, because if we call you, and if you get the call, this is the real deal, and I need you to show up. This is, for our audience, a very critical point of this interview, because it's delicate General, there's, there are legal ramifications here, and I forgot Absolutely. what the term was. Is it casi pomatanus? It yeah. sounds something like that. It's where excessive force may not be used against American citizens by military. Does that enter into your thinking because you have to maintain the peace? You're there to maintain civil order, correct? That's correct. But as of how much force you are allowed to use? So the first thing that you, you absolutely have to have in terms of um, what we call our TTPs, but you really do need to have something that says, here's the level of force, here's the escalation of force. And everyone needs to understand that. And that escalation of force, right, the rules of engagement, you will hear it. Uh, I hate to call it rules of engagement when we're talking about civilians, so I always say escalation of force, because it tells you very specifically what you can and cannot do. And you have to understand that we're in those types of situations. We are in support of the civil authorities. Always remember, we're in support. We're not in the lead. We are in support. And that means that we take our lead and our guidance from, at this, in this particular instance, the, the police. 
And so we were always paired with the police officers. Forgive the vernacular, who's running the show? Is it, in fact, the police or the governor at the police at his discretion? And, and in that order, and then you're just supporting? Right. So, the, so what happens is that um, in this particular case, the incident commander was the chief of police in Baltimore City. That was the incident commander, because the incident commander is at the lowest level. The governor has responsibility for the whole state. And so the governor is going to be very involved, and the governor has to be able to provide the resources necessary, which includes calling, the governor is the only one that can call out the National Guard. You speak with the governor almost every day. In some fashion, I mean, you in may miss fashion, a day here, right. but even in just, you have close contact with the governor. When that was happening, did you have, I'm not asking for inside information, but did you get any direct calls from the governor saying, General, I know you have a situation, what do you really think? Did, you, did that kind of conversation happen, or were you getting it secondhand because Look. you're supporting? So as I was watching things unfold in the news, so in my office at home, I have a TV. There's a reason why I put it there, so I can watch things as I always have it on to the news because I'm always watching what's going on. And uh, sometimes I do channel flipping, so I hit multiple news stations. But, um, you know, there, there's a chief of staff that we work with or an assistant chief of staff that gives us the direct line into the, the governor. Um, and I was back and forth on the phone with the assistant chief of staff having a conversation about, okay, what do you need from us? And, you know, do you need me, um, you know, down in Annapolis or do you need me out at the emergency operations center? I said, all you have to do is call me and just let me know where I need to be. And so when I got that phone call, it was, you need to show up in Annapolis and we need you here like, you know, ASAP. And so that was really me then going down and getting engaged with the governor and the team to really start talking about what are our options and, and what do we need to do. The book on you, General, is that you have an approachable style. You're firm in command and know your decisions, what has to be done, but you're approachable. Some generals are not. That's the other part of your life that comes out, isn't it? The smile, the engagement, no matter on what level the person is. You try to, do you try to do that every day? Do you try to ask for that guidance? Because you do, you've been consistent. And that's the word on you, is that you've been consistent. Right. And so, you know, I, I didn't used to smile a lot. And I actually talk about this in my book, is I had lost, I, it's kind of like I lost my smile. And I say that because so many things had happened that I felt like if I didn't smile and I was like this tough guy, that um, nothing, would, you know, nothing would penetrate that kind of armor that I put up. And so I felt like it, you, know, you showed your leadership skills by not smiling and being really tough. And in fact, what I really learned is that you show your leadership skills through competence, through actions, and being a very versatile leader. And so that's kind of very different. And I also learned that you need to be um, very vulnerable as a leader. If you want to be a good leader, being vulnerable is a place where you need to figure out how do you get to without giving up everything. And that's what I've, I've been able to do for myself is I feel like, you know, when I came out and kind of told just my whole story, that was me getting to that level of vulnerability that I wasn't comfortable doing very early on because I wasn't comfortable with it myself. And so I think that it's allowed me to be open and approachable because I enjoy people. And so when I look at individuals and when I look at a private or, you know, when I look at an airman, um, I'm not looking at them and saying, oh, my God, they're at the bottom. I'm looking at them and saying, God, how young they look. <laughs> I wish I was there again because that's where I was at one point in time. And, and I just think of they have their whole career ahead of them. And then I want to know, you know, are they going to school? Uh, do they have a family? And, you know, you start asking those kinds of questions. And so... To me, it's an appreciation of people. And when I look at it, in the military, people are our most important asset. And I think, to me, as a leader, I need to appreciate our most important asset. Your words, most of the people I speak to haven't seen what I've seen, and I'm glad. But I'm also glad I can bring them leadership lessons from a different life where, no, where nothing is taken for granted and value really does come from adversity. 
Does that mean that on some level you showcase or share your experiences to show that there can be an inner strength that develops leadership, that helps develop leadership? I think it's, it's an inner strength that not just helps develop leadership, but helps to develop you as an individual. I think it's, it's a little bit broader than that. And when I look at the challenges, and I use the example of, of the session that we talked about today, and I said, you know, life is, it's, it's a journey, but it, it's really like a, a marathon or a triathlon because you have multiple events, you have multiple things that you need to get through, and you never know what's going to be thrown at you in the middle of that or what, you know, how your body's going to react or how you're going to react. And so I think that you know, when we look at life overall, there's a lot of things that's thrown at us. And we can do one of two things. We can get stuck and not make any choice and just say, okay, I can't move forward and, uh, and I just don't know what to do. Or we can say, I have a lot of choices. Now, you may not be aware of what those choices are. So the thing is, how do you assimilate that information? How do you collect that information to be more aware of what your choices are? And sometimes that requires us to step outside of our comfort zone and to say, okay, where do we need to go with this? And how can I open up the door for more choices? Are you able to apply the, the principles of leadership in your personal life, because you're a wife and a mother. And are you able to take the position of general, you're not gonna be general to your kids, but you're gonna use some of your tools to lead them as their parent? Absolutely. So um, I am a, uh, I'm actually a qualified uh, executive coach, right? So I'm certified. And so I step into the mode of, of a coach with my daughters. And I will ask them, so do you need mom or do you need the coach? Or do you need kind of that conversation from a mentor perspective? You actually engage and in that. I will step in different roles and I actually will ask them, so do you need mom, right? Or do you want the, the hardcore, you want the coach to give you that kind of that hard lesson? You give them a choice. Because different. I can give them a choice. And they need to tell me, well, what do they need for me to be able to engage? And so... I think that that's what works very effectively with me and my daughters, and it's allowed them to be women and, and set their own course without having to live the life that I would have thought that I wanted them to live, right? So uh, I wouldn't have necessarily asked my oldest one to be a police officer, but that's what she chose. So if that's the career she chose, then how do I help her to be the best as, that she can be at, at being that, that officer? Show of hands, how many are parents of young people in this audience. Anyone? I know it's a lot of, okay. There's your takeaway right there, Captain. You take that, you can use that with your own. How do you define your style of leadership? If someone were to ask you, they have never seen you in the command, how do you define your leadership style? Well, I would say that I am a, a versatile, um, probably more of a, I don't want to say, a, I used to always say that I was a very direct, you know, kind of person. I still am very direct in terms of a leadership style, but I choose, which gets into the versatility, I choose when I want to be direct and when I want to be a little softer, so sometimes I can be a little harder and soft. I think that I've developed a leadership style that I can change depending on where I'm engaging. And so that to me is extremely important. Um, I think it's all about the characteristics and the, and the different skills that I bring. But what I have to be very, very aware of is if I am working with a group of, let's just say, students, my leadership style is going to be a little bit more laid back. I'm going to be in a little bit more of a coach and mentor role than I would be as if I'm working with a group of, of soldiers where we're working on a strategic problem. Because uh, my timeline is going to be different. The, the way that we're going about it, the thinking, I want a lot more crisp. I want a lot more shorter. And I want to be able to kind of move through things. So you need to be able to flow in and out of different styles that suit you. So you need to figure out, so what is it that you're going to bring? And so I will flow in and out of different modes depending on what the situation is. So I would probably say that my leadership style is more based off of situational leadership. We have one of the most intelligent and brave group of people with us in this audience. We're going to take your questions now for General Singh. If you would, come up to our microphone, speak right into the microphone, 
Anyone on the end, come right down. We have precious minutes to do this. So somebody come and start it. I'll, I have a couple of questions for the general, but come right down. We're going to take your questions. We'll go left to right. Do so right now. And we'll start as soon as we have you guys at, at the microphones. General, I want to ask you before we begin with these questions and ask, what day in uniform stands as the one that you might have been the most scared and how you overcame it? Yet you couldn't let him see a sweat, but you were a concern. Let's put it that way, General. You were a little concerned. So this one sticks out really clear in my mind. So I was in Afghanistan, and I had went out to um, the National Police Training Center. And we were really looking at the facilities, and I wanted to interact with some of the recruits there as you know, because they had a new class that was in there, and I really wanted to see, okay, what did their facilities look like? Are there some other things that we need to help them uh, work on? Um, a huge issue that I had at the time was one of the contracts for their uh, dumping of their waste and, and cleaning of that, and so that was a big issue that we were talking about. And so when I think about it, we had a very small team because when we went out, I mean, it was just a very small team that we had to go out to these, these particular sites. And, you know, you had requirements where you had a certain number of long guns and short guns. And unfortunately, as a, as a senior officer, we get a, a short weapon. They didn't give us a long one. Um, and so here I am having a conversation. So one of the Afghan um, trainees um, spoke very good English. And he started engaging in a conversation with me and then translating for some of the other ones as they start asking me questions. And so they were intrigued because, one, they knew that I was a senior officer. So it wasn't like they didn't know who I was. But what was interesting is that when they started having a conversation with me, it was about 150 of them that encompassed me. And when I started noticing that a few of my team members backed up against me, and they were just like, ma'am, you know, we're right here. And, and I was totally oblivious to what had just happened until I looked up. And I'm standing in a sea. That was like the most uncomfortable feeling because I didn't know, okay, is this going to go good? Is this going to go bad? And so, you know, the only thing that you can do at that point in time is, I mean, obviously, I, there, there was no apparent danger other than I just didn't know which way it was going to go. And, and you don't know. I mean, we've had so many different incidents. You, you just don't know. So you've got to go on, okay, I'm going to trust that, okay, I'm going to turn around and look and see where my team is. And, you know, my civilian uh, security guys were there, and they were some pretty big guys, so I could always see where they were. And I'm just giving them the eye as in, okay, and they like, you know, man, we got it. And the only thing I can do is to feel, okay, where's my nine mil, right? And so if you ever, you know, watch me, I would go from a different – stance from here to where I do this. And that just meant that, you know, my hands are right where I needed them to be. And I would take a very different stance. And it allowed me to, you know, very, you know, graciously put my hands on my nine mil without telling you that my hands are on my nine mil. And, you know, and then I start looking around and saying, okay, if, if stuff goes really bad, who am I taking down first? I mean, you know, they're, they're all kind of half my size. So there's going to be some fight and, you know, we'll be doing some close combat moves. I mean, that's, that's like, I know that's really bad to say, but that's kind of what rolls through your mind. And as I'm sitting there trying to pay attention and talk to these guys, I'm thinking, okay, am I in any kind of danger? And so, um, you know, when we, we came out of that, we kind of did an, an after action review and says, you know what, we may need to rethink this. We need to make sure that you're protected a little bit more so that, you know, they don't, we don't allow ourselves to get into that position. That was probably one that caused me to, let's just say what we call the pucker factor. It went up very, it went up very high. <laughs> Thank you, General. On the left, good evening and welcome to our discussion with General Singh. Go ahead. Good evening, General. Good evening. Uh, Staff Sergeant Sterling Till, 175th AMXS, Maryland Air National Guard, um, currently studying Homeland Security. Cool. Um, just a, a mental question. Um, could you share with us what your process is when you like just mentally like fall off track and like just it's just chaos in your head what is it that you do to kind of like get back on track um so first off when we talk about just getting off track so um exercise 
is a required, like I, I actually, my poor aide, he gets so sick of hearing me say this. I'm like, you didn't build any time in my, my calendar so I can exercise. Because that helps me to stay physically on track. Um, mentally, I go to music. And so music is like the first thing. And, and I just like absolutely nothing else but, you know, just music. And when I say music, I listen to what we call old school music. I like the R&B, I like jazz, I'll listen to country. But it's just something that kind of takes my mind and lets me just relax the mind. Um, I do meditate and I stay very focused. And when I say I meditate, um, this is something that I try to do more and more and more because it helps me to stay very focused and very centered. And so that becomes an extremely powerful tool of just kind of sitting and just being with space. And if my mind wanders, it's okay for it to wander as long as I bring it back to being very focused and centered. And so those to me are, are some of the things that, that I really get in. And so when I'm going in for a meeting, you know, I know that I have to be in game mode. And that means whoever, like even being here for this event, I have to be in game mode. I can't be stuck in the meeting sessions that I was in last week. And that was, you know, in Macedonia. So I can't be still thinking about, okay, I gotta, I gotta wrap up on those sessions. No, I have to be here and be present. And so I think is, you know, what helps me to be able to do that is, is being very comfortable with who I am and knowing when I need a break. And when I need a break, it's like I go in my bathroom and shut the door and get in my tub. And nobody's allowed, <laughs> nobody. Except for me and my bottle of champagne. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, General. You just inspired me over here now. Good evening. Good evening, ma'am. Midshipman First Class Cook, Aerospace Engineering, Senior Year. What are some ways that you use to celebrate diversity in your command? To celebrate diversity? In your command. Well, so any time that I get someone that is diverse, or someone that has diversified their experience, or someone that steps outside of their comfort zone and will try something new, we try to figure out, figure out how to celebrate that. And I say that because diversity means many different things. And so diversity is a big deal to me, but it's a big deal to me not because of, you know, am I taking away opportunities for a certain criteria of folks No. What I'm talking about is making sure that everybody has the opportunity to be able to succeed. And it doesn't mean that everybody will. I, can, I can't promise that everybody will succeed. What I can promise is that everybody should be given the opportunity. And so I celebrate the things of diversity of thought, diversity of capability, and then just the whole diversity of individuals together. And, you know, the one thing that my consulting environment taught me is that I can bring a team together from all over the world and I can actually create a winning project that we can go after. And I can do that without knowing anything about the backgrounds of the individuals I work, as long as we have a common goal, a common understanding, a common vision, and a common objective that we can work towards. And so once you understand that, you can take people from no matter where you're at and bring them together and you can be even more successful because it's that diversity, that perspective that you're gonna get from different sides that will make you more competitive. And so that's how I celebrate diversity. On the left, your question now for General Singh. Good evening, ma'am. My name is Christina Kresge and I'm a sophomore studying Homeland Security. My question is, what would your advice be to young women who work in male-dominated career fields in the military where a blind eye is commonly turned to, a se to sexual harassment in the workplace, and speaking up about it doesn't seem to make much of a difference in behavior. That's a tough one, General. That is a tough one. So first off, um, speaking up and speaking out can be two different things. And so we can't stop because there are a few that choose to continue to turn a blind eye. Because if we stop, then we've just given up. And so what I would say is it is part of our responsibility as officers, military officers. It is part of our responsibility as leaders in any organization 
to ensure that we're not allowing it to go on. Do you have to say the buck stops here? And if they don't hear you, there are different avenues. You need to push to get to the right level in which it can be handled. Because you know, we're not tolerating it. And so I understand that there are still bad people within the ranks. And there are people that will try to block that. And, and what I would say is that we have to continue to eradicate that. That type of behavior should not be allowed and we shouldn't condone it. I don't condone it within my ranks and when I find out that it happens, then we do something about it, we take action. But we all have to do that. And what we have to understand is that you know, there are things that, I hate to say the young folk, right, but there are things that the young folks today seem to think is acceptable. When you join the military, it is not acceptable. And we have to talk about those things. And so it's not until we can have that level of conversation to say, hey, you know, that really made me uncomfortable. Why not? If someone crosses that line, why can't you turn to them and say, sir, ma'am, or whomever, I'm sorry, but you just made me very uncomfortable. First off, that's going to stop them. And then secondly, that's going to put them on a, a warning. Now, there are the challenge is there are times in which that may not work. And then you have to actually escalate it and take it to the next level. And so just because there are individuals that may not hear you, that doesn't mean that we should still not talk about it and we should still not report it. Because at some point, someone will get it. Thank you. Now to the right. Good evening, ma'am. Um, Cadet Ramirez from Michigan, pursuing a degree in aerospace engineering. Uh, ma'am, my question is, um, as second lieutenants coming into a new environment in the military, what would be some of your advice and all the challenges that you face to us cadets? So first off, second lieutenant, remember, it's, a, it's called a butter bar for a reason. You're just starting all over again. So you're not a private, but you're kind of a step above a private. Well, maybe not even that, all right? And so just remember that you are, you are new in your role and you can't come in as if you know everything. You can't come in with this cockiness that says, okay, I'm bad, because uh, you will get knocked down very quickly and you will get, you know, kind of, you'll have to readjust uh, your perspective and, and where you come from. And so the, the first thing is, is to start learning how to do a personal assessment. Okay, if this is my role, what is it that I'm expected to do? So what's expected of me? What, am, what do I expect of others? Because you need to get, start getting very clear about that very early in your career, being able to communicate what you expect from others. But the most important thing that I think most sec like lieutenants and really captains, what people don't understand, and probably even at some of the more senior levels, is that we don't take the time to understand what we are expected to do. So I will have a conversation with someone. They want to come in and they want to have an office call with me. And they may lay a problem out there. And the first thing I, I kind of do is once I hear what they're talking about, my first question to them is, what do you want me to do with this information? Are you asking me to take action? Are you asking me to give you guidance? I mean, so we need to make it just that clear. And so when you come in as your first assignment, start being very inquisitive about asking the questions so that can help you better define what you're going to go off and do and what your role is. And you know, there's, a, there's a, a book that gives you some very, what I think are great step-by-step -step things, and it's called The First 90 Days. This is a book, it was, it was redone a couple of years ago. I mentioned it to uh, one of the classes, I think, earlier today, but it's called The First 90 Days. You can get it on Amazon. That is worth buying and keeping. Meaning, you know, don't just read it one time and you don't have to read it from cover to cover. And it gives you some very basic step-by-step -step things that you can use anytime you go into a new assignment or a new role or a new organization. 
And when I say it's very basic, it's things that you wouldn't necessarily think about if you were just out there experiencing it, but it gives you a very, to me, what I don't want to say it's fail safe, but it just gives you a process in which you can use every single time. Thank you. Over here, your question now for General Singh. Good evening, ma'am. Cadet First Lieutenant Gomez, Air Force ROTC, Attachment 157, Junior, studying unmanned aircraft systems. How do you deal with the challenges you face leading all the different branches that compose the Maryland National Guard? Is there a different management style, in other words, for the different branches that you have to lead? Oh, yeah. <laughs> sort of follow up on you, sir. So, so uh, thank you, because I, so I'm sitting there going, oh, yeah, there's different styles. So when I think of my Air National Guard, um, they were, uh, they are, are very different in the way that they operate. And so understanding more about what their capabilities were, but more importantly, getting to know the leaders there. Um, they were a little suspect of me. Uh, they didn't like to let me loose by myself, and I'm not one that likes to be controlled. And so that got old very quick. I'm just like, oh, no, 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 no. You're, you're not going to escort me every single where I go. I want to be able to get out and talk to the airmen. But it was once that they understood that I was there to really understand you know, them and to understand what I needed to do to engage to be able to help them better do their job. How can I help them to be more ready? What do they need from me? And so that was a different style than, and it is a very different style than how I interact with the Army side. Even though I'm still there to kind of doing the same thing, but you, you have to realize that they are different services. And then when I interact with you know, my Navy counterparts and when I interact with the Marines, it, it's you know, slightly different. But there's the one core principle that we all are, are, are based off of. It's right, we need to know you know, what is it that we're being asked, right? What, what, are we, what is being expected of us? Every single one of us wants to know that. And so how do we communicate that? And that to me is a common foundation amongst all the services. Having a very clear vision and being able to communicate that out so that people know what is it that they expect. Thank you. Over here now, your question. Good evening, ma'am. I'm Mitch Shipman, First Class Hamilton. I'm a senior here at Embry-Riddle studying unmanned aircraft systems. My question is, because you started out uh, prior enlisted and Major Ray all the way up to Major General, I'm assuming you've encountered your fair share of good and bad leaders. So my question is, what can we as future uh, military leaders do to create more successful leaders like you, even if they're starting from a junior enlisted rank? Right, so you're correct. I mean, I have had what I would consider to be good and bad leaders, what others may not consider to be the same, right? Because we all have a, a different view of what makes a good leader and what makes a bad leader. Um, what I like to do is to look at it and say, well, is it really that they were a bad leader or that they were different and that their perspective was different? So how do I kind of take a step away from that and say, instead of saying that they're bad, realizing that people have different levels of strength, and some will be stronger leaders and some may not be as strong. And when I look at if I am working for a leader that may not be as strong, then what am I bringing to the table that helps to bolster that leader? Because that's about teamwork. And so when you think about it, you are going into an environment where teamwork is incredibly important. Your individual readiness is important, but teamwork, how do you play your part as part of that team? And if you, if you always look up and say, well, you know, I don't like what this leader is doing, I mean, it's easy to be able to kind of troubleshoot from the bench. But when you're the leader, it may not be, a, it may not be as easy. So I, I've now gotten to the point where I like to take the step back and say, you know, I get it. Maybe they're not as strong of a leader as I would have liked them, I would have liked them to have been. But they brought something very valuable to the table. So then, you know, when I look at building a leadership team, I know what my capabilities are. I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. And when I build the team, it's based off of that. I don't build a team that looks like me, talks like me and walks like me. Because that would be bad. That'd be very, very bad, right? Um, I try to build a team that will add to 
and enhance the level of capability that I bring. And so I've gotten really good at spotting talent and, and spotting it from the most unusual places where I'll say, that person needs to be up on my team. And it's not based off of, okay, I know this person, I know that person. It's usually based off of, I may be in a meeting where something they say, and then I watch them over time, and I'm like, okay, that's the one I'm targeting. Because they've got a capability that I think I'm interested in trying to exploring to see where it goes. And so one of the things that you need to be thinking about as a, as a leader is getting very good at being able to kind of work that. And just know yourself. Know yourself. Over here now, your question. Good evening, ma'am. My name's Taylor Street. I'm a mechanical engineering major. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, my question is, how do you affect change of like diversity in lower ranks? Like if you're a E4 or you know, just trying to affect more change, even though the upper ranks aren't really about it. Right, so if you're looking at change in terms of diversity, mm -hmm. um, diversity of people, so the only way that you can do that in the lower ranks is we got to recruit from the right population. Right? You have to understand the population that you have. When I say the population, meaning you have to understand the ranks that you have. For the National Guard, we are responsible for our recruiting mission. So each state is responsible for their recruiting mission, which is slightly different than it is for the reserve component, and it's different than what it is for active. And so I actually had my team. I wanted to know, what is my diversity breakout? I have to report that anyway. I have to report what my diversity looks like. And there are certain, there are certain levels in which we have to know, OK, I have this many officers. I have this many males. I have this many females. Then the question becomes, where are we recruiting from? And what does that population look like? So when I talk about a recruitable population, if I have a diversity issue, and I'm saying I do not have enough diverse candidates, that nine times out of 10 means I may not be going to the right places. So let's look at what the data says. So where are we going to recruit? And then when I look at where we're going to recruit, does that population support me bringing in diverse candidates? If the answer to that is no, then you know if you're gonna continue to go to a pond and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to this pond and I'm looking for shark. Now, you know, there's no shark in a pond unless somebody put it there. But nine times out of ten, there's not a shark in that pond. So why am I going to keep going to that pond saying, well, geez, I wish I'd catch a shark. I wish I'd catch a shark. Sometimes you need to go to a different pond. So I want to go and fish where the sharks are. I'm not going to go to a pond. I'm going to go to the ocean. And so my team took a look at the, the demographic data, and they laid that out for the state. And then we laid out where are we recruiting from. And if, and if that doesn't get me to the numbers that we need to be, then what's the problem here? And so I've got a really smart MBA guy that actually laid some of this stuff out for me. He's my recruiting lead right now. And I'm going to tell you, I mean, he has, he's done what I call the slicing and dicing of the data all the way down to he can tell me if we were to get more recruits in this area, then we can double our diversity numbers at the lower level. You have to be that, um, you really have to be that vigilant about going after it and building it in at that level. Because if we don't recruit the diverse population, then I can't, even, I can't even begin to have a pipeline. And so right now, we can, we can look up and say, we don't have enough diverse leaders. Well, if we don't have them in the pipeline, we're not going to get them. And so we have to build them. And then we have to retain them. And our problem is we're not retaining them in some cases. So what do we need to do to retain them? What is causing them to leave? Well, you can look at the various things. It's usually life. It's family. They want to take you know, some time out. So then how do we change our system? Right? Overall military system, how do we change that to make it so that we can have on-ramps and off-ramps very differently than what we do today? And so I think until we can really get to true talent management, we probably are not going to be able to solve for this at, at total. And when I say talent management, that starts with recruiting, and it ends with retention, and it keeps them for life. Thank you. Over here, your question for General Singh. 
Good evening, ma'am. I'm Midshipman, third class Wheeland. I'm a sophomore studying aeronautical science. So E1 to 08 is, that's a big gap. It's, and it's a very impressive bridge to cross. Um, you've already given lots of really good advice that I've taken to heart and written down that I'll use and pass on. Are there any other specific snippets and traits that you would also attribute to your success that lots of us here could use and in turn pass on to those that we lead? Absolutely. So one that I haven't really touched on a lot is, is, is building your network. And so networking will become incredibly important. You're going to meet people. You need to learn to catalog them very early. Who was it? What were they responsible for? Because nine times out of 10, you'll probably run into them again. And so you really need to become very good at doing that. And I, I'm like, this is the worst thing for me. But I, will me I remember faces, right? And I may not until you jog my memory. But if I, would have, if, if I would have gotten that a lot earlier, I think that would have been huge. And so building your network. Then you need to have a mentor. You need to have someone that you can go to that is willing to give you that very uncolored advice where you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything, meaning you know, it's not gonna cost you any rank or anything like that. They're gonna be very open with you about, hey, you, know, you need to be thinking about this. So you wanna have a mentor. And then as you start looking, you always need to have a sponsor. Mentors and sponsors are usually two different people and they're not the same thing. A sponsor is gonna be someone that's going to recognize the talent in you and that will speak on your behalf when you're not there. And, and when I say, you know, it's, it's, you know, they're going to be able to carry your story while you're not around. And then if you have not in, in invested into having someone that when you get more senior, and, and the one thing that I did stepping into this role, because I am a, a certified coach, but I can't coach myself. It's like the worst thing to do. It doesn't work when you're trying to talk to yourself. And so I put some time and investment into getting my own executive coach. And she can have a conversation with me that most can't. And, and she will question me in a way that is very different and it gets me to think on a very different level because I need that. Because when you get to this level, there's not too many places where you can go to have that level of conversation. And so to me, those are, are very important things. And then, you know, one of the things I talk about is there's this little, sometimes a good person and sometimes a bad person that sits on your shoulder. And you need to learn, okay, when are you going to listen to that bad person? Probably not. You got to pluck them off, right? Don't let them get into your mind and start clouding it with all the noise about what's not important. And, and that's tough. In this environment today, it's very tough. Sift through all the crap, push out all the noise, and focus in on what's most important. Don't lose sight of that. Over here, your question. Ma'am, Cadet Hanal, undergraduate student here at Henry Riddle. My question for you is, in your career, how have you dealt with fellow leaders who think that they are at a level that is above them, and yet they're doing harm to the unit or to the group of people you're in? Well, now I bring them into my office and we have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if they're right up underneath of me. And, and I say that, so you have to be good at delivering the tough messages. And when I say you have to be good at having tough conversations. And yes, they will, it's uncomfortable. But you can't pretend that everybody is at the same level and everybody's capable of the same thing. And you actually do more harm by telling them that they're good and when they're not. And they have a shortcoming. And so the thing that I will ask you to do is as a leader, you need to be tough and you need to deliver that hard message but you need to try to leave them whole at the end of it. And there will be people who just don't get it. And, and even if you smack them right between the eyes, they just don't get it. But you gotta deliver the message and don't hold back. And so I pride myself on having those tough conversations 
And it really is up to that individual as in whether or not they can recover. I give them the opportunity to recover. I give them the opportunity to walk away and saying, yeah, it's bad, but so what? We move on. And just because it doesn't work out in this doesn't mean that it won't work out someplace else. And so when I have, you know, I, you have to remember, I'm like working with a lot of my more senior folks. And so now the conversation is with them about, okay, you're not staying forever. I'm not going to keep you until, you know, you're however, you know, where you think you're going. So it is now time for you to go. So now how do we help you make that transition? That's the conversations that I start having with individuals. And I do it in a very different manner where when they come in with me, I stop calling my sessions counseling sessions. And I now call them mentoring and coaching sessions because I look at even my senior level folks need to have a very different level of questioning and discussion about what is their future. And I ask them, what does your next five years look like? And, and if they're not delivering on that, then the question is, well, why? What's stopping you? Thank you, ma'am. We got two and two. We're back over here in our final folks with questions for General Singh. Hello. Good evening, ma'am. I am Midshipman 4th Class Albert. I'm a freshman studying aerospace engineering. If you could pinpoint the single hardest decision in your career, uh, could you enlighten us on your thought process and how you handled your emotions through the decision? Hmm. Um, I'd say the single hardest decision was um, making the decision to throw my name in the hat for this job. Really? And, and walk away from my civilian job. That, that, was, that was tough. Because I was going to ask you at some point, I've been waiting for somebody to say, how long do you want to do this thing? That's a good question. Um, when it becomes not fun, that, then I know it's done, right? Yeah. But, um, I mean, I have plans. I, I have a view of how I think things, you know, should go in the future and whether or not things work out one way or another. Obviously, I have more than one plan. And so gotcha. there's a lot of things that I'd like to be able to accomplish. Um, but right now I'm having fun. And I say having fun. I mean, literally, I am having a lot of fun working with my uh, country partners, so my state partnership program, and, and watching us achieve a level of success together. Um, and that to me is it's extremely exciting to be able to work with other countries and, and to work us wor watch us work towards common goals and to be able to create things that we hadn't even thought about. And so um, I would have to say that making the decision to step out of a corporate role when I've worked all my life to get to that level in that corporate job, a job that I loved and enjoyed, people that I loved and enjoy, and creating great and innovative things, and to step into this role um, you know, that was a family discussion. It was a long family discussion. I want and to make sure that you got your question answered. Did you get your question answered? Uh, I just yeah. wanted to make sure that you went through the, uh, your thought process on it and how your emotions affected it. Yeah, so it, it was, you know, I'm not going to say it, it was definitely a significant emotional event because I didn't probably think about it in the right manner because my husband and I, had already worked on, we had been working for two years in building a custom home that was quite a bit above the standard of what I make today, so that's okay. Um, we've made it work. Um, so we didn't really think about it in that manner. So I didn't think about it enough, right? So you because took a pay cut to do this. <laughs> we did, so, um, so I, didn't, I didn't think about it in the manner of what did that mean to our standard of living until we were kind of in the midst of it. Um, and so him and I, you know, we, we talked about it, and, and what we realized is that um, I had a certain expectation of where I would like to see change in the organization go. And if I wanted to be able to affect that, that meant that I had to step forward. So I could, you know, they have these t-shirts that says, you know, you can stay on the porch or you can run with the big dogs. And so I had to make a choice. I could sit back and pinch it and say, okay, it's somebody else's job to do this, but I don't like where the organization is going. 
or I can step forward. And so I made a conscious choice to say, if it was not me, then who? And, and was I okay if someone else was gonna step forward, which meant that you know, I stay in that followership mode, right? I'm a, still a leader, but I'm a follower. And, and my answer to that was no. And so that's why I stepped forward. And so it, it, I'm not gonna say it was an emotional event, like, you know, oh my God, I was just like, what did I do? Uh, I am an individual that once I make up my mind to move forward and do something and I'm in that mode, I move forward. Um, I, I don't second guess. I just say, okay, I could have done this in a different order, but then I got to deal with the consequences. That's a choice that I made, so I deal with the consequences. Thank you, ma'am. Absolutely. Over here, we've got precious minutes. Go right to it. Good evening, man. Kenneth Hopkins, studying communications here at Ember Riddle. I was just curious, is there a certain moment in your career as a leader that you're particularly proud of, or in other words, is what is the most rewarding experience you've had as a leader? Yeah, I, I would say um, when they told me that they wanted me to put in for becoming a general officer, that's like the pinnacle. That's more than what I ever hoped for. I mean, I hoped to make a colonel. <laughs> I was gonna be happy with that. But when I, I got the, uh, really the call and said that they wanted me to put in, uh, put my packet together and put in for general officer, to me, that was, that was, to me, them recognizing, thank you for what you've done, but more importantly, thank you for what we think that you have the potential to do. And, and that was kind of the highlight. I still look in the mirror and can't believe it. I count them every single day. <laughs> See if they're still there. Thank you, ma'am. Right over here, final on the, on the right. Good evening, ma'am. Midshipman, fourth class vice, freshman in aerospace engineering. When working with people from other cultures, what would you consider the most important aspects or traits to have when interacting with them? That's a great question. Thank you. So uh, again, I'm going to come back to being inquisitive, being open, and not prejudging them. Because things are not always as it seems. And so when you go into a relation, you know, kind of an interaction, relationship, or whatever it is in terms of business, um, the first thing I try to do is to be very open. And I try to, to get the feel for the individual that I'm interacting with. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. And then I develop a strategy, right? Okay, how am I going to work this relationship? To either move it forward or am I going to just say, okay, that one's, that's not worth it, let's go this way. And so you really do, I, I don't go in and prejudge anyone. I kind of try to really see, okay, what am I reading? What am I getting? How do I put all that together? And then how do I, how do I react? And so I think we need to do that in every single engagement. Just be open. Be open to new ideas. Be open to, to new things. Thank you, ma'am. Finally, this question. Ma'am, my name is Cadet Third Class Kruger, and I'm with the Air Force Detachment here uh, studying aerospace engineering. You mentioned earlier tonight that when you were starting out in the service, you felt like the whole world was against you. Um, I've encountered some cadets in the detachment and, and around who certainly go about their habits like they have a chip on their shoulder, and I was like that last year. But if you ask me when and why it changed, I wouldn't be able to tell you. How could we, as potential leaders, help those who may be going through life like that change their views? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question, right? So they need to do this self-reflection. Because you need to understand, well, what is it that you have the chip about? Because most of the time, it's not about anything that they're experiencing here. It's something that they brought with them. And so sometimes it's just having that conversation and, and more importantly, yourself being there for a mentor for somebody else and allowing them to be able to get a little bit more vulnerable with what's really bothering them. Because what I find is that, you know, there's some underlying things that we may not know about that someone's dealing with that could be causing them to have this view and, and that chip. And for me, it had to do with self-esteem. It had to do with this matter of self-worth. And I, I, I just felt like the whole system was not helping whatsoever. The problem is I didn't understand the system. I had no clue. 
And so then it was a matter of, of developing a network of people around me that could help me see beyond that. And sometimes just looking in the mirror and asking yourself, who am I? What's my problem today? That can be very powerful. That Thank means you, you also have to answer it. Thank you. Everybody, keep your places. First, I want to thank Tony Petro, uh, Tony Petro up in control for running tonight's program. Chivalry Wu, who for five years has been assisting in videoing these presentations. Sandusa and Hannah, thank you so much for helping tonight. And uh, Ken Hunt with his team spirit from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for making the suggestion on August 9th that we do this. Thank you, Ken, wherever you are here in the audience tonight. I thank you for that. In a moment, I'm going to call Captain Adam up. But first, let's tell folks what we're going to do on Monday night when we come back, our final chapter for this fall. Bob Schieffer, for more than 25 years, was the host of Face the Nation on CBS. He was also the anchor for the CBS News with Bob Schieffer on Saturday and Sunday. He's written a book called Overload. It's the story of not only the election, but the changing process of how we get news. We're overloaded with news sources and information. He'll talk about it, he'll sign copies of his book, and take your questions Monday night, beginning at 7, doors open at 6, here on the campus of Embry-Riddle. Now, before we conclude and uh, let you go for the evening, and we thank you for being such a great audience tonight, great questions, too, from all of the students, I ask Captain Adam Karlowitz to come up here with I believe a group here would like to make a presentation to the general. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Bernier. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for coming out tonight. We really appreciate uh, all of your wisdom that you've shown to us and, uh, and taught us throughout this, uh, this evening. Uh, I am Captain Karlowitz. I'm the executive officer for the Army ROTC program here at Embry-Riddle. And um, tonight, I know that the general loves to recognize excellence. She loves to recognize excellence when it comes down to cadets and soldiers. Um, and so for her to create this opportunity to recognize some cadets that are in the, uh, in the audience tonight is, is humbling, I would say, after hearing your story, ma'am. Um, so without further ado, would the following cadets please come down here and line up to my left, your right, starting with Cadet Verdez, Cadet Sanchez, Cadet Giardo, Cadet Bukowski, Cadet Shaw, Cadet Kramer, and then would uh, Mr. Bernier be so kind to come up here on the left as well, as well as uh, Mr. Hunt. So I'm going to uh, quickly describe uh, what these cadets have done and, and why they're being uh, shown this favor. Um, so over here we have Cadet Sanchez. She is the battalion executive officer for the Eagle Battalion, compromising of over 300 cadets. And she's in charge of overseeing the staff and its operations on a daily basis to ensure that all of the training is conducted properly. Then we have Cadet Guiardo. He is the S4, um, who is in charge of all of logistics and resourcing for the entire battalion's training events. And he has been doing a phenomenal job this semester. Cadet Verdez, um, he has been the S3 in charge of operations. Now, this, the size of our battalion is the size of a real battalion, okay? So when it comes down to what he has been going through in terms of synchronization and coordination for training events, it has been phenomenal what he has been able to do this semester. Then we have Cadet Bukowski, Shaw, and Kramer. These three individuals have been distinguishing themselves uh, from the MS3 class. They have been voted as the number one through their peer evals. They have performed number one within the field training exercise that we recently had at Camp Blanding. And they have been performing at the top of their physical fitness scales. Um, and then over here, of course, we have our host for the night, and Mr. Hunt, who has been uh, the coordinator for this entire day that the general has come down and uh, uh, been able to interact with our cadets throughout the day through the MS3 class and MS4 class. So without further ado, we're going to be able to recognize them. Oops. Yes. 
So you get one of the, yeah, <laughs> thank see? You. Thank we were you. trying to hide that from you earlier, so thank you. <laughs> it worked. And so this is what we call our, our challenge and our excellence, our coin of excellence. Thank and you, so Jeff. I want to thank you for what you do. And for all of these, these young ones here, thank you for not only what you do, but what you're about to do as you start moving your career ahead, right, and becoming outstanding leaders. And so um, when you look at this, it actually has the Minuteman on front, which is the symbol of the National Guard, but I added a Minute Woman to highlight the level of diversity. Uh, and when I say the highlight the level of diversity, it's because we fight shoulder to shoulder. It doesn't matter whether we're race, gender. It, does, it, it just really doesn't matter. The point is that we're all working towards the same end goal. And so that's one of those things that I like to highlight because that's what it says. And then on back of the coin, it says relentless. And we should be relentless in everything we do and relentless in our pursuit and relentless in bringing out those stories and sharing all of the experiences for, for these folks. And so if you think about that, live your life and just be relentless. So thank you. Yes, thank you, man. Please, please give these, uh, these fine folks a round of applause. Thank you all. General Singh, ladies and gentlemen, General Singh.